What's up everybody? My name is Dr. Garrett Rossi and I'm a board certified psychiatrist who makes mental health content here on YouTube. If you're new to this community, I would love to make you a member of it. It really helps me to know that this information is valuable to you and that it's working to help enhance your understanding of mental health. And if you're a returning viewer, as always, thank you so much for all the love and support. Now, as many of you might know, or maybe you've seen it already, maybe you haven't, there's a new Netflix documentary out called Take Your Pills, Xanax. So of course, we're we've been talking a lot on this channel about anxiety disorders and anxiety treatments, so I felt like this is a good topic for us to go through today. What are some of the points from this documentary that they got right? What are some of the things I don't agree with entirely? And overall, what's my impression of this documentary and its portrayal of both anxiety disorders and the use of medications to treat them? So what this does is it combines interview footage from physicians, patients, journalists, etc. And they go into a deep discussion about anxiety disorders in general. And then, of course, the treatment of them all framed around this idea of using Xanax or benzodiazepines. Now, for the most part, I thought they got a lot of things right. I thought there were a lot of reasonable discussions about anxiety, its treatment, and the role of medications. So I feel like there's no better time, given the topics that we've been recently discussing here, to cap off our, our anxiety series with a discussion of Take Your Pills, Xanax. Okay, guys, so one of the things that stood out to me right at the beginning of this documentary series was the idea that anxiety and fear are the same thing. So a lot of people kind of lump these things together and the documentary really did the same thing. They made it seem that anxiety and fear are the exact same thing and have the exact same neurobiology involved in every case. And I don't really think about anxiety and fear as being the same thing. I actually think of these as two separate things. So first of all, what is anxiety? So anxiety is what an individual feels when they're worried about something that could potentially happen in the future. So I'm worried about some future event, right? Something happening in the future is causing me to worry, to think of the negative outcomes that could potentially occur, etc. Now, if you watched our other videos on generalized anxiety disorder, then you would know that the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM-5, has made excessive worry the hallmark of generalized anxiety disorder, and they really have limited the physical symptoms of anxiety to things such as muscle tension. And that's going to be important for the rest of our discussion, and I'll explain why in the next section. Now let's talk about fear for a second. So fear is one of the core emotions, right? This is something that's really ingrained in us as humans and fear is one of these core emotions. It goes along with sadness, anger, joy, excitement, and disgust. It's different for me than anxiety though, because fear is, is not so, we're not afraid of some future event. Fear is triggered in the moment, right? When you see that bear walking on the hiking trail that you're on, or you hear the rattle and you see something slithering by your feet, you your fear centers in your brain are activated immediately, right? It's activated in that moment telling you there's something to be worried about here, something to get the hell away from, right? So it's not that we're obsessing about some future outcome or event the way anxiety kind of presents itself, that excessive worry that's characteristic of generalized anxiety disorder, it's more that there's something present in the environment right now that's threatening and I need to protect myself and get away from it. Now we can talk about the fear center in the brain. This is something I actually haven't talked very much about on this channel, but we should talk about it here because it's something I kind of like left out and um, it's important to know what we're talking about here. So in humans, the fear center of our brain is known as the amygdala, right? This amygdala and which stands for almond, and that's of course because it tastes like almonds, right? Well, no, wait a second, that's not right. It doesn't taste like almonds, I don't know what it tastes like, but I do know that it's shaped like an almond, and that's where the name comes from. So the amygdala is known as the fear center of the brain in humans. Uh, it fires when we see that bear in the woods on the hiking trail that we're on, it's going to start firing, telling us, hey, like you better get away. And obviously, when something like this is going to be firing, this is going to trigger what we call the fight or flight response, which leads to things like increased blood flow to our muscles, right, so that we can run away 
or fight or whatever we got to do and increased energy levels in order to again get away or fight if necessary it really prepares the body for this process of either running away or defending itself to some type of threat or attack so I've talked extensively about the mechanism of action behind benzodiazepines before in other videos, so you can take a look at those on topics that I've covered, such as Xanax in the past. So benzodiazepines, real simply, enhance GABA activity by acting as what we call allosteric modulators of the GABA-A receptor, meaning that they don't bind to the same location that GABA binds to on the GABA-A receptor, but it's another site or another location. Now, this is the major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the body and of course in the central nervous system and brain and it acts to sort of dampen everything down to calm everything down what the benzodiazepine does on a mechanistic scale is it's going to increase the frequency of opening of chloride ion channels which in turn is going to hyperpolarize right, the cell and prevent the neuron from firing. So basically it's going to act as an inhibitory process by allowing more frequent opening of chloride ion channels, allowing chloride to flow into these neuronal cells and of course decrease their firing. I think one of the things this documentary did a nice job of was explaining that anxiety is part of life. And this is something I've talked to you guys about in many of my videos. I've said before that we all have anxiety under the right circumstances. I have anxiety, you have anxiety, we all have anxiety, right? It's not necessarily a bad thing to be anxious. In many ways, anxiety reminds us that this situation is important, that we need to be appropriately prepared for whatever it is we're anxious about. So a healthy amount of anxiety can be a good thing. Where things ultimately go sideways, and what we're talking about in this documentary, what we've been talking about in my videos as well, is when the anxiety is chronic, persistent, and severe. As I've stated in the pre previous videos, some people are just more prone to anxiety. These individuals are high in the big five personality trait neuroticism. So some people in the population are very high in neuroticism most of us are going to fall somewhere in the middle but of course like any other normal distribution you're going to have outliers on the right or left right you're going to have outliers who are going to have excessively more anxiety than the average person and you're going to also have outliers on the other end of the spectrum who are going to have virtually no anxiety so there's always going to be outliers even in in in, in any normal distribution it's obviously not going to be as many people that are going to fall into these outlier categories. That's why we call them outliers. So most of us will fall in the middle, having a reasonable or appropriate level of anxiety given the circumstances. The one thing for me that was hard to follow in this documentary is that they seem to combine all the anxiety disorders together. At one point, they were describing specifically panic attacks and social anxiety, NGAD, kind of all as the same thing, as if they're all part of the same disease process. And again, I think these things are very different and the treatments are very different. The course of illness is very different. So there is significant overlap. I do want to point out that we've talked about that in the past, how there's a lot of overlap between a lot of these disorders. But the course of illness and treatment plans will vary a great degree, and this is why I always stress the idea that diagnosing someone properly is the starting point for any treatment, whether it's an anxiety disorder that you're treating or depression, bipolar, etc. So the reason I'm kind of harping on this idea in the documentary that combining all these things together doesn't make as much sense is because benzodiazepines work really good for the physical symptoms of anxiety. So when the interviewees start talking about Xanax in the context of people experiencing panic attacks, it's like, well, yeah, of course, because we need to make this distinction because, of course, panic attacks have a lot of physical symptoms. If we look at the DSM-5 criteria for panic attacks, it's vastly different than that for a generalized anxiety disorder. So in my mind, it's, it's obvious that if I'm having a panic attack, taking a benzodiazepine to alleviate a lot of those physical symptoms associated with the anxiety is going to be very successful and very effective. Now, if we're talking about GAD or social anxiety, the anxious thoughts are still going to be there. 
I might feel more calm physically, my heart might not be racing, my breathing might be slowed down, but still those anxious thoughts are likely to remain, which is usually the problem when you're prescribing benzodiazepines for things like generalized anxiety disorder. They just seem to be less effective for removing those thoughts that are the driving force behind the anxiety itself. So to me, this didn't really make a whole lot of sense and it was an important distinction that wasn't really uh, well played out in the documentary. So one thing that the documentary did a nice job of is talking about baseline temperament and explaining that a lot of our baseline temperament is secondary to genetics. So these are things that we can't change. It comes from our genetics, from our parents. We're not easily able to alter these things. Now, that though only is one part of determining whether or not somebody is going to have more or less anxiety. The other part of the story is of course environment. So we may have genes that predispose us to more anxiety, but experience matters a lot too. In child psychiatry, we've seen this movement, there's been a huge focus on minimizing the number of so-called adverse childhood events or ACEs. We discovered, although in my opinion this was quite obvious, that things like sexual abuse, physical abuse, loss of a parent can result in significant risk for poor health outcomes in the future. This is both mental health and physical health that we're talking about. So baseline temperament will predispose somebody to anxiety, and if you combine that with a significant lifetime history of trauma, such as these ACEs we're discussing here, that could set the table for future anxiety disorders. Let's talk a little bit about the prevalence of benzodiazepine use. The documentary made it feel like everybody's on benzodiazepines and prescriptions have skyrocketed over the last several decades. Now, while prescriptions have increased, we can't deny that fact, we have to explore, in my opinion, more importantly, why. Why are we seeing such an increase? One thing I see all the time clinically is that primary care providers are prescribing benzodiazepines to patients early on in the treatment for anxiety and depression. Now, primary care doctors work really hard, they have a lot on their plate, and they are often the first line of contact for patients with anxiety or depression. And like any good doctor, they want to help the person, and sometimes they say, oh, well, you know, benzodiazepines help with anxiety, why don't we prescribe a benzodiazepine? This is a reasonable option, but of course that leads to problems, right? Because they haven't explored psychotherapy, they don't really have the time to work with the patient on what might be the underlying causes of their anxiety. And so the person walks out of the office with a prescription for Xanax. And there's a good reason why research tells us that most people who see a primary care provider for anxiety or depression actually do not get better. They don't get better. In fact, as few as 20%, so think about this for a second, as few as 20% of those started on an antidepressant in the primary care setting will show significant clinical improvement. So that tells you something about the situation. And again, this is not a knock on primary care doctors. They work super hard, they have very difficult jobs, and you know, mental health should not necessarily be one of the things that they're handling primarily. However, you know, they've kind of been thrown into this mental health crisis like a lot of other people, and they're usually, again, that first person that encounters the patient, and they wanna to try to make a difference. The other important trends I'd like to bring attention to is the risk of pres prescribing opioids and benzodiazepines in combination. This can result in increased risk for overdose death and it significantly increases the risk of respiratory depression when these two medications are combined. In addiction treatment, we have the same kind of problem. We often, people, patients rather, often feel very anxious when they're coming off of medication and when they're starting, say, medication treatments for opioid use disorder. So it's common to want to address that anxiety, and one way you might think about addressing that anxiety is to start something like benzodiazepines, or possibly even benzodiazepines and gabapentin, for that little extra relief. Now all of these medications in, com in combination are going to put the patient at risk for adverse outcomes. Another thing that we should be paying attention to is where are these benzodiazepine prescriptions coming from. And if we look at the map, we can see that the highest rates are in many of the southern states and places like West Virginia where the opioid epidemic has hit the hardest. So it's no surprise that benzodiazepine prescriptions are now increasing in those locations as it's become more of a national emergency and national attention 
has been gained in terms of prescribing opioids appropriately. The final item to discuss here is the increased rates of benzodiazepine prescribing in the elderly. So this is a concerning trend. We're seeing more elderly patients leaving with prescriptions for benzodiazepines, which can be dangerous. And this seems to be concerning for a number of reasons, right? Elderly patients are more at risk for falls that can result in fractures and significant health problems. They can result in altered mental status. And there's also the possibility that the long-term use of benzodiazepines in the elderly population can, risk, can run the risk of developing dementia. So there's a lot of talk over the years about the increased risk of dementia with benzodiazepines. And I would say that the data has been mixed. There's been some studies that have come out and say like absolutely increases the risk of dementia. Some other studies that have sort of rebuted or refuted that evidence rather. Um, but the truth of the matter is that I would say it's largely in favor of not prescribing benzodiazepines in older populations if you can avoid it. And of course, avoiding the long-term use of benzodiazepines in all populations because these are not medications that were ever intended to be continued long term. Coping with anxiety is no easy task and there are no shortage of bad coping strategies that you can implement to try and deal with your anxiety. I don't think it's unique or old that alcohol, drugs, etc. are being used as coping strategies in our society and that's because we've always been attempting to in one way or another alter our state of consciousness. It's not exclusive to the past. People have been doing this forever, and it still remains, as it did then and as it does now, a poor way of coping with anxiety. I think one of our problems is attempting to cure the stresses of life. A lot of the things that people are anxious about are normal standard things that any of us would be stressed out about. In my clinical practice, I do not believe that taking a medication or using, an, or using alcohol is a way to quote unquote cure anxiety. Most individuals need to take a long, hard look at their life. They need to really explore their life a little bit deeper and see where this anxiety is coming from, right? What is the driving force behind it? And where are places in their life that they can make or implement changes to reduce this internal tension? When someone takes time to systematically dissect the causes of their anxiety, they are often already, they often already know the answers, right? They know what they need to do. Take more time off of work, practice better self-care, exercise, eat healthy, right? Sleep better. All these are examples that come to mind for me as well as for most patients when you ask them to really start to think about the things they could be doing to help relieve some anxiety. Most people though feel trapped, right? They do not believe they can carve the time out of their day to do these things, to do the self-care that's necessary, and that is the reason they turn to medications, drugs, and alcohol to cope. While I do believe that medications such as benzodiazepines have their place in psychiatry and should remain a part of treatment regimens in the right context, they are designed to be used short term. With my patients, I set limits early in the process, letting them know upfront that we are not using this as a long-term solution to their anxiety, so they better start figuring out other ways to cope with it. And it's not my job to relieve all of their stress and tension, it's my job to just help them to be able to get through these situations a little easier. I'm not gonna go over all of the side effects of benzodiazepines here. I've done that previously in other locations on my channel, so if you're interested, like I said, see the videos on Xanax that I've already covered. Now, the one thing the documentary did do a nice job of is describing changes in memory. So that's important. This is something that's often not thought about with benzodiazepine use. Now, the ability to lay down new memories is impaired when somebody's using benzodiazepines. Where this really becomes a problem is if somebody is in trauma-focused psychotherapy for PTSD, for example, then they may not be able to lay down those new memories required to reconsolidate the previous experiences. So this is going to be a major issue. This is why I don't recommend anybody who's going through trauma-focused psychotherapy take benzodiazepines while doing so. They also focused on this idea of disinhibition caused by GABA-A activity, right? This idea that taking benzodiazepine causes you to become disinhibited. Now this is less to me a side effect than it is a response to the medication that should be expected to some degree. Most of the individuals that are presenting with anxiety disorders are wound too tightly, right? They're too tight 
and they have trouble relaxing. So the goal of taking the medication to some degree is some degree of disinhibition, right? Some amount of disinhibition. The problem with this is that when this response occurs, this disinhibition occurs excessively, right? If it occurs so much so to the point where the person becomes slightly altered, they put themselves in embarrassing situations because they're not fully aware of what's going on, or they have the inability to work or drive, for example, this can cause problems. Another thing that they talked a lot about in this documentary was withdrawal from the medication. And we know that withdrawal from benzodiazepines can be deadly, right? The risk for seizures, rebound anxiety, rebound insomnia, all can be very distressing and concerning for a patient. The problem with benzodiazepine withdrawal is the variability we see in terms of patients' tolerance to dose reductions. Some patients can taper off very quickly and have no problem. They have no issue coming off these medications in a reasonable amount of time. Others have to be tapered really slowly, sometimes in the case of months to years. While I would not say that everyone you encounter has to have these prolonged tapers and are sensitive to dose adjustments, you still want to be mindful of the risk of withdrawal symptoms and you still want to be screening for it and thinking about it when somebody is undergoing a benzodiazepine taper. The example in the documentary, though, that I have kind of a little bit of an issue with is the guy was in there, he's, you know, doing his chemistry, he's pipetting liquid microdoses of alprazolam because he hasn't been able to get off it effectively without having these severe withdrawal symptoms. Now, yes, of course, there can be rare cases where that's going to happen and we have to be prepared to handle it. Definitely. Totally agree with that point. But the way it was presented in the film kind of made it seem like everyone who tries to come off these medications has to go through this horrible process to come off them. Benzodiazepines can be safely reduced under the guidance of a qualified professional. All right, guys, so I'm going to wrap it up here and I'm going to talk just a little bit about their final message to people in this documentary, right? So what we see here in the end was, in my opinion, more of the same recommendations that my patients would normally tell me, doc. I already know I have to do this, right? And that's kind of what was a little disappointing, but I but expected, right? They talked about using complementary alternative medicine to help. They talked about using exercise, diet, mindfulness therapy, and psychotherapy, right, to get at the underlying causes of excessive worry, which are all good things. But again, all things that patients already kind of know and are probably just not doing, right, in many cases. They introduced the idea at the end of the film to say kind of like the world is broken, right? The, like this is a, we shouldn't have to adapt our lives to a defective world that needs to change. And we shouldn't have to accept the world as it is. That's a fine argument. I don't disagree that there's parts of our society, culture, um, the world in general that need to change on a massive scale. The problem is the change that they're talking about that would be required to help everybody feel less anxious would have to occur on a massive scale and it's not going to happen overnight, right? It's going to take time. So this still leaves the question, you know, what do I do right now? How do I help myself with my anxiety right now? Got to find a way to do it, right? So I'm personally active in advocacy work at the local and state level for mental health and that's one approach you can take. You can become active in your local community, at the state level, at the national level, you know, advocating for change in this world. And I think that's definitely a good thing. What we have to remember, though, is it takes time to affect policy change. It doesn't happen overnight. And it requires a lot of time and energy. And this is time and energy that not every patient is going to have a desire to engage in. The only true way in my opinion, as well as in what they concluded in this documentary, was that the only way through to the only way to fix your anxiety problem is to push through it, right? Push through it with as many resources, with as much support as you need, but you ultimately have to face your anxiety in order to get past it. And my opinion, as well as the opinion of many others is that daily life is painful. Life is pain. It's difficult. Every day is hard. And to some degree, we have to accept that there's going to be a certain amount of pain, anxiety, depression associated with just existing in this world. 
And the first step, obviously, to getting past that, just like it is with any other problem, is accepting it, right? Saying like, yeah, I'm going to have to live with some degree of pain in my life. Medicating away feelings that are part of daily life is certainly not the solution, and it can be one of the reasons why we ultimately find ourselves in trouble.